I'm going to tell you what, John. Uh, my goal had always been when you look at the way his sweats fit his legs. I mean, yeah. those aren't <laughs> leggings. Those are just like loose sweatpants. Right. That they're freaking stretched around his legs. To me, yeah. I've always thought that's the coolest look. When you have regular sweats on, but you can stretch them out like they're leggings, then you know you've got a set of wheels on you. What the hell right. is that, John? What is he doing here? I think he's stretching his shoulders. I think he's got his arms back. But this is, you know, this is kind of how he got hurt because he got hurt doing dumbbell flies. And that's how okay. he tore his bicep because he would go till he couldn't go anymore. And then when he, he would go on the bottom, he would do like, um, like, partials you know and he was bouncing uh, it yeah and then when he bounced it that's how he tore his bicep yeah that makes total sense too i wonder yeah, if he would do yeah. things different today knowing what we know now about training you know right yeah you would think he would right because they were all still just inventing stuff back then what's up guys welcome back to think big bodybuilding media i'm scott mcnally and back with me again by popular demand is bodybuilding historian natural mr olympia and the uh podcast host of bodybuilding legends what's up mr john hansen how you doing what's up scott how was your holidays dude it was great man hey great to have you back people loved that last episode so they were like you guys you got to bring john back to do some more uh if you're new to our content then let me encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell because we have several bodybuilding podcasts each week plus bodybuilding reactions a bunch of shorts a bunch of stuff to keep you busy through your cardio your commute whatever else you're doing and if you enjoy our content then do us a favor leave us a comment let's get this thing rolling and see what we've got now there's a bunch of music in here so i know we're gonna have to cut some of the sound out that is a badass truck to start I want that. That's a very appropriate truck to have outside of Gold's Gym. Big and muscular. Anyway, we're here in Southern California to take a look at the world of bodybuilding, especially the world of the Mr. Olympia hopefuls, all those bodybuilders who are out to win the most prestigious bodybuilding contest in the world. The challengers. That's what the challengers. Okay. That was Bill Dobbins. He's a uh, writer, photographer. Okay. I wondered. He looked familiar, but I had no idea who he was. Yeah, I used to be. You know, I moved out to California. I moved out in 1978 with 50 bucks and a plane ticket, and that's all I had to my name. I lived with 25 people across the street from the gym, and I dreamed and I, and I, every day, and I still do about winning Mr. Olympia. Dang. A big hand now for the Golden Eagle. Yeah! Well, this is footage from the uh, 84 Olympia, Scott. This okay. New York. So I, I noticed on this tape that they used footage from 85 and 84, but I believe it was all filmed in 86 leading up to the Mr. Olympia that year. Okay. Ooh, I got to turn this down a little bit. This is copywritten yeah. <laughs> music. So how, how was his 84 look compared to other years? Well, Tom's peak was 81 and that's when he got third place when franco won and uh, i thought i thought he should have won that year okay um, so going into 82 tom was the big big favorite because he was kind of considered the uncrowned mr olympia after 81 uh, and then unfortunately tom tore his bicep about six weeks before the 82 olympia oh geez so he decided to do the contest anyways which was a mistake and you can see you could see he that discrepancy the there. And you could see it, and it, it marked him down. And it, plus, his condition was a little off, and he, he didn't look like 81. Okay. So he dropped down to sixth. And then in 83, for some reason, he got it repaired after the contest. And then in 83, he decided to sit out 83, huh. and he just guest posed. Yeah. Which didn't make any sense to me. He should have sat out 82 and came back in 83. You know what I mean? There's still a, so he had it fixed, yet there's still a huge discrepancy, isn't there? Yeah. What he did was he waited too long because when you tear your bicep, you're tearing the tendon that attaches your bicep to the uh, elbow. Yeah. And the longer you wait, the more that tendon goes up your arm. Okay. And when his was fixed, you could see it's still short. So it, they fixed it, but the yeah. bicep was still short. And he, so, you can see uh, all I, I his tore my bicep in uh, 2000, and I got it fixed within five days. I mean, you have okay, to get fixed right because I love the gym. Yeah, I mean, sitting in my office all day long, talking to 10 or 15 different countries, and putting tours together, and closing deals, and I, I love it. To me, that's just like the gym. 
it's, it, I feel the same way. I could very easily go to the office all day long and get the same satisfaction. So I feel that you've got to be an athlete and you've got to be a businessman as well. You've got to be able to juggle those things. And it's not easy. When you turn pro, you turn pro for a reason. Because now it's time to make money. Now it's time. Not that money is the most important thing. Of course not. But you've got to be a businessman as well as an athlete. I, don't, I think that most people think, most Mr. and Mr. Olympia competitors think you've got to win the Olympia to make money. If you think that, you do. But then again, even if you win it, which you've seen some of Mr. Olympians who don't make any money either. And to me, uh, I happen to like the business function as well. Not, not, I also like being an actor on the stage. You're an actor, you're a businessman, you're an athlete, and you're a diplomat. I'm traveling to six countries a month sometimes. It's meeting, shaking hands, uh, huh. talking about bodybuilding, the thing that we all love. Yeah, that was interesting because when he... Um I remember when this video came out, he was like the first one to voice that, how it was important to be a businessman. And Tom really looked at it like that. You yeah. know, once he got his pro card in 78, he really went out and promoted himself as a, as a businessman. He did a lot of guest posings, a lot of seminars. He wrote books and he was really going after trying to make the money, you know, and he was very popular, especially after 81 yeah. when he got third. Man, he was traveling like every weekend in 82. He was going all over the place, all over the world. And he was getting bigger and bigger, too. He was freaky. Do you think he did pretty good for himself as a bodybuilder back then overall? Oh, yeah, he had to. I mean, yeah. I don't know how much money he made, but um, I think he was probably one of the top money makers just because his work ethic. He worked so hard and traveling so much. And everybody yeah. wanted to see those legs, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, every day. And uh, he really looked. Every day. Brought that, you know, he really promoted that, you know, and he was really good at seminars too. And seminars were really big back in the eighties. Like he'd go to Europe and he'd do seminars over there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, back then there was no, no YouTube, of course. So you never really got to hear the bodybuilder speak and you never really got to see him in person. So if they ever came to your town and did a guest posing in a seminar, I mean, that was really valuable that, yeah, it was really valuable that you get to learn from them directly. You get to hear them talk directly and yeah. tell you what works and what doesn't, you know? Yeah. Let's see what he says right here. New gyms, it's, it's difficult to be on a very strict training regime, but now that's why you turn pro. You turn pro to be a pro. You don't turn pro. If you want to spend your time in the gym, you should stay in an amateur. Huh. Oh, yeah. Ooh, there's some music. <laughs> there's the part we got to talk over. Dude, he had a sweet car too, man. He always had some some cool yeah. old cars. He loved cars. Yeah. Yeah, it's he crazy really, to, to still see really him cool today. Did he? Yeah. I still see him around. Like, I, I remember him training Sergio Jr. in, in mm -hmm. 2017 when I was out at uh, Los Angeles doing a contest. And I remember okay. doing one of my final workouts and I was doing like some tricep extensions laying on a bench or something with a dumbbell. And I, my, my friend who I was visiting with, she was like, hey, she's like, do you see who just walked behind you? It was Tom <laughs> Platts right in the middle of the gym there. Wow. Cool. Yeah, yeah, he hasn't stopped. I wish he would do interviews. You know, he it, he doesn't yeah. he he doesn't want to do interviews. He wants to get paid, from what I understand, to do an interview. Yeah. And I'm like, eh, yeah, you know. But whatever, I guess to each their own. And he's he's done plenty of interviews in his day. I guess is the way he probably looks at it. Yeah, he's still so popular because of his passion. You know, he's so like into the you know his, his passion for the sport and he the way he talks. You know, he's so passionate that people just love, they get, they get motivated just listening to him talk, you know. And then his workouts were legendary, especially his leg workouts. Oh, God, yeah. You know, I forgot, man. I've got a picture of me and you and Tom Platts together. Yeah, at that at that Olympia, right. Yeah, yeah. You guys were both there for old school muscle. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a picture with him. I got a picture with you. And then I got a picture with the three of us. So right. that was freaking that. awesome. You were trying to convince him to uh, do an interview with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, because I would love to have had him on my show. But honestly, with how much you know and the history of bodybuilding, interview yeah. with you would have been so much better. So I, I feel like you're the guy who should have yeah. done that, you know? Yeah. Oh, here we go. We got the workout happening now. <laughs> His his technique was so crazy. It was, wasn't it? So he obviously believed in training the failure. A woman one time said to me that there's, yeah. there's sets and there's reps and there's biceps and there's triceps and there's love and there's hate. And every body part is an emotion. And that's the way I train. I mean, I'm sort of in the gym. I'm not counting how many times I'm doing something. I'm expressing myself from within. And that's oh, where I come here? from. It's an emotional experience for me. I'm very much into feelings. 
it's more than just uh, sets and reps and numbers. Huh. You know, to me, numbers are, are meaningless. You know, I don't like the only numbers that are really meaningful are the, the, the money market numbers and the checking account. <laughs> They're the numbers I count. I don't remember my calorie numbers. Oops, let me turn that sound down there. <laughs> I hear Jerry Lee Lewis coming in. I'm going to tell you what, John. Uh, my goal had always been when you look at the way his sweats fit his legs. I mean, yeah. those aren't leggings. Those are just like loose sweatpants. Right. Yet they're freaking stretched around his legs. To me, yeah. I've always thought that's the coolest look. When you have regular sweats on, but you can stretch them out like they're leggings, then you know you've got a set of wheels on you. What the hell right. is that, John? What is he doing here? I think he's stretching his shoulders. I think he's got his arms back. But this is, you know, this is kind of how he got hurt because he got hurt doing dumbbell flies. And that's how he tore his bicep because he would go till he couldn't go anymore. And then when he he would go on the bottom, he would do like um, like partials, you know, and he was bouncing Uh, it. Yeah. And then when he bounced it, that's how he tore his bicep. Yeah, that makes total sense, too. I wonder if he would do things different today, knowing what we know now about training, you know? Right. Yeah, you would think he would, right? Because they were all still just inventing stuff back then. Yeah. Well, he definitely knew what he was doing with legs, that's for sure, because his legs were phenomenal. How long do you think it took him to catch his upper body up? I think the closest he came was 81. And his legs were bigger than ever in 81, but his also his upper body was bigger than ever. I remember okay. from 80 to 81, I mean, that last video we reviewed, that was in 1980. That was the comeback. Yeah. And this was, uh, you know, in 81, one year later, it looked like he put like 15 pounds of muscle on his upper body. He was so much bigger. Pullovers I mean, with 130 close. there. Yeah. And do you see that part too, when uh, in the beginning when he was stretching? Yeah. That was pretty wild. He was a great... He was very, very flexible. He would stretch for like an hour and a half before he did legs. One of the reasons for the increase in popularity of bodybuilding over the last few years has been the exposure it's received in Joe Weider's Muscle and Fitness magazine. Joe not only uses the best bodybuilding photographers in the world, but he's also begun to use the best commercial photographers as well. Back when Joe had dark hair. The reason my photographs is so important in our magazine and why I spend so much money, time, and effort wow, in getting the very best photographs are two reasons. The main reason is that when a bodybuilder poses That's for a yeah. magazine, I feel it's my obligation, my duty to see that this bodybuilder is presented to the world at its absolute best. Straighten your head, Liz, and a smile. Great. <laughs> That right. hair on all three higher, of them. Lose, the back yeah, now. I always <laughs> try to find the most creative and most imaginative no, no. photographer as possible. Aren't you back at Okay. I myself will take off time to work with these models to make sure that when they put themselves in a pose, that a pose will be perfect. Because the only way that the world can relate to him is through the photographs. Back then, yeah. That's all they had, yeah. photographs in the magazine. Raise your hand. Yeah, Joe was famous for like being in every photo shoot and he buys it and moves the people around, you know. Really? Even like back in the 60s when he just had like Muscle Builder magazine and it was just bodybuilding. He would be at every photo shoot and he would move the guys around and make them make sure that the pose was perfect, you know, like he is here. You know what's crazy to think is that these women were absolutely jacked at that time. You know what I mean? Like. This yeah. is like this is what a big female Very looks good. like, you know, a super hyper muscular female right. looks like this at that time. Nice. Yeah, this was female bodybuilding in the eighties, right? It was a great camera. I believe that's a Janice Hasselblad. Reagan with uh, Gaspari. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, those are great cameras, man. They're worth so much now too, because uh, there's been a comeback in in using film. Mm. Okay. But when I was in art school, you'd you'd get one for God at least a thousand used, maybe two thousand. Wow. Okay. Great. And now they're going for two or three. Hmm. I believe this was in World's Gym, and this is uh, this. I think this was taken I right after the uh, mind, before the Arnold Classic started. Arnold and Jim Lorimer were promoting the Pro World in Columbus in okay. March, and uh, Rich Gaspari won that in '86. Okay. So I think this was even right after that because he's still in really good shape. In he's still really ripped. And be another name like John Grimmick. When you hear of bodybuilding legends, Frank Zane, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I want you to say in the 80s and 90s, it was Rich Gasparri. And we do say that. 
<laughs> I've proven to people now that I can be the best, you know, pro coming up. I want to prove that I can be the best bodybuilder ever. And now I have seven months to train for the biggest contest. I'll go into that gym and I bust my butt and I go to win. And that's it. It's Such kind a of small funny. Platform. I have like two little voices in my, yeah, in my head small. when I do train. One sometimes says, uh, why are you going to the, into the gym? And then there's this other voice that overpowers him. Come on, what are you doing? You know, you're coming to the gym. You got to train. You got to win. You know, you got to get bigger. Bigger. You got to get bigger arms. Yeah, World's Gym. So they didn't have any music in World's Gym, right? Right, right. And it was kind of a small gym, but the equipment yeah. was supposed to be great because Joe Gold would personally make all of his equipment. All of that. You could huh? see it was pretty small, right? I mean, it wasn't that big. Yeah. Yeah, no no music, no slamming weights, right? It, it right. needed to be like quiet basically in there. He would, he would kick you out if you were slamming the weights. Who had the story of bringing a boombox in? It looks you like there was him? a photo shoot going on back there with Tony Pearson. Oh, no kidding. Do you remember that story? Somebody brought music in there. Somebody brought a boombox in. No, no. I can't remember who did that. And of course, they got kicked out real quick. Sean Ray told me a story. He went in there with John Brown when Sean Ray was just a teenager. He was, I think this was before he even started competing. Yeah. And he walked in and it was like, he couldn't believe. Like Rachel McLeish was there, Matt Mendenhall, like all these people were there and he was freaking out. Yeah. So back then the, the benches, they had the, uh, the stands were real close together. So he goes over there and he puts a, a plate on one side of the bar and the whole thing tips over and hits the ground. <laughs> And Eddie Giuliani, who was the manager, runs over to him and he goes, get your ass out of here. Don't slam the weights in here. <laughs> oh, my God. He said, Sean said he left and he never came back until he was a pro. <laughs> no kidding. Lee Priest liked to train there, too. He, I, I, We were talking about that before when we did a review video of him, that he liked yeah. to train at Worlds because he felt like Golds was just like a zoo all the time. And he was, wanted to be yeah, away from that. contrast. Yeah. Gold, Gold's had the music blasting all the time, and it was real wild atmosphere. And then which, uh, World which was, was more quiet. Which would you have trained at back then? Uh, in my 20s, I probably would have went to Gold's. You know, yeah. Just for the, <laughs> but I'm such an Arnold fan, I probably would have went to World's Gym just to see uh, if I could see Arnold. Because yeah. he would always come in there and work out. So when was Rich at his best? This that show that he just did, I think, was his absolute peak when he did okay. the Pro World in '86. Uh, he got third. Or he got second in the Olympia that year. Um, so that was the first of his three Olympia runner-ups because he got three Olympia runner-ups from '86 to '88. Yeah. But that Pro World man, he looked phenomenal. He was like 215. Skin was like saran wrap, veins all over. The muscles were so full and thick. Nice. And he was only 22. Yeah, he looks so young here right now. Yeah. I mean, the guy reached, here. he reached his physical peak at 22. <laughs> That's wild. I used to eat in the off season to maintain my weight. I know how many calories to eat to lose five pounds, to lose two pounds. I've done that. I've, I've almost, it's almost come to a science now. I know my body that much. Well, he was the first one that I remember to really count everything. And I remember when I read that, I started doing that too. You know, oh, like yeah? weighing all his food, counting up his macros. Nobody was doing that back then. Yeah, he uh, he he paid attention too to food sources. Like I remember him talking about if he was going to use pasta, he would use a whole wheat pasta versus just yeah. like a white starchy pasta. Right, about the gluten and stuff. Yeah, and here yeah, he's super yeah. back squats and, and leg extensions. Okay. That's a move right there. How about that? Yeah. You like supersetting. You were telling me before you were you were supersetting leg press and squats the other week. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that occasionally. That's that very is a brutal. Tough. That's a brutal <laughs> workout, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's still in good shape there. Oh yeah, he's still strided. This must have been right after the pro world. I think he must have went to California to do some photo shoots. That's what I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, he said what he was doing a little bit ago uh, earlier on. Man, those shorts couldn't be shorter. I'm telling you, and that <laughs> stringer couldn't be more stringy. You know what I'm saying? It's it's hardly a shirt at this point. Right, right. <laughs> when shorts were shorts. Yeah, yeah. 
So Joe made all this equipment. Yeah, Joe Gold made a lot of his equipment. That's and here crazy. he's doing uh, lunges, which back then, not many guys did lunges. Like that was a girl exercise. That day, really? Yeah. Just through experience, yeah. also by records. I keep records of every contest. I've kept in records from the universe, Night of the Champions, Olympia, and the pro world. And with those records, I just keep on improving. I keep on knowing more and more, and I keep on knowing my body to a T. But you always can learn more. That's the, another thing. I, I can never say I know everything about nutrition, but I feel that I'm a, just a little bit ahead of the other guys in the sport. He was. I just feel that I have something that a lot of people don't have. Like before I even entered the pro world, I already said that I won the show. Good, now right? that may sound yeah. cocky, but it's just that I'm so confident in myself that I can say that. And it just looks like I'm just going through everything, you know, through the time lapse, but I've already won the show. And that's the way I feel now in competing in the Olympia. I have such a positive outlook that I would win that when I do go on stage, the judges can see this aura, you know, around me that I do really want to win. And I have this, you know, I just look, there's the winner because of that positive look that I do have. You know, I'm a fighter. When I go on stage, I fight. If only he had a little bit wider structure, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's where Haney beat him in the structure because he really beat Haney in the legs and he was yeah. harder and he had a great body. He just, just couldn't beat uh, the shoulder to waist differential of Lee Haney, you know. When I did compete in the middle yeah. of this Olympia, is from 85. This is his first Olympia you know, when he whew. got third. Because the first time Peeled. in 1985, yeah. I came in third place. And no one has ever done that, go from the amateur ranks in one year, except for Lee Haney, and come in the top three in the Mr. Olympia. Afterwards, that glutes I knew that two pro shows yeah. were coming up, and they were the world championships, the pro world championships in 86, run by Arnold in March, and the Los Angeles Grand Prix. I wanted to prove to everybody that I can win those pro shows, and I knew the main competition who would be in those shows would probably be Mike Christian. You know, he is a great competitor. Well, I went into the, the pro world and the Los Angeles Grand Prix, and I got a clean sweep, all first place. The first time that a pro in two shows got perfect scores in huh. two shows. The only one who's done it before was Boyer Co, but he only won one pro show, perfect score. So I did prove that you know that I could win pro shows, you know, and I did prove to people that I am capable of winning Mr. Olympia. The main competition now for me is Lee Haney. Yeah, and that structure is. Yeah. So his his uh, Rich's legs were better. I I could see that. Yeah, they were thicker and more striated, and plus he had really good hamstrings and calves too. And he had the glutes. Yeah, he doesn't have the same conditioning as Rich, you know. Yeah, but his structure was so much better. He was taller. Yeah. Lee was so much uh, bigger and taller than everybody. I remember back then at the Olympia, when the Olympia started, they would have all the guys come out in a line. Yeah, And they would say, here's your Mr. Olympia competitors. And that's how they would start the prejudging. They would all just come out in a line. So if there was like 15 guys in the Olympia that year, they would all just stand there. And the crowd would go crazy. No and kidding. And everybody would look. And then you'd see Lee Haney standing there. And you go, well, he's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> it, was that, it was that obvious. You know, he was just so much taller and wider with a small waist than everybody. Yeah. You had Lee on your show, didn't you? Yeah, several times. Yeah, he's a great interview. This is Albert Beckles. So okay. they had the outside weight pit at uh, at uh, World's Gym. They had this whole outdoor training area. And so guys would go out into the sun and train, which was really cool. <laughs> that would be cool. Looks like the sound is cut out here on the video anyway, but so we can't hear him talk. Now, Beckles got second in 85. So he was the runner up the year before at the Olympia. And uh, he won the Night of the Champions in 85 as well. He beat Gaspari in the Night of the Champions. So he had a great year in 85. That was probably his best year as a pro. I love his and, technique uh, there on that yeah. pull down. Elbows in close. That's a lot what I try to do nowadays. He had crazy arms. His biceps were amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the craziest arms ever in bodybuilding, I think. Yeah. I remember uh, VJ was always talking about uh, Beckles in his arms. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Whatever he had happened kind of to him. Short, he had kind of short biceps, but when he flexed it, it peaked like unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. What happened to he, Albert Beckles? He's still alive. Uh, I believe he's in his... There's always been a debate about his age. Um, <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think people think he's eight years older than he is, but I think he's like, I think he, his correct age was, I think he was born in 37 or 38. Okay. So he's, he's up there now then. So that yeah, makes him like 80 something. Late eighties. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of talk around the gym here that Haney was so great that uh, he will just go on winning. He'll be another Arnold Schwarzenegger and things like Which that was. makes me strong. I yeah. just smile. You know, I says, well, if that's the way everybody in the gym thought, well, then I'm going to surprise them. Contestant number six this evening, our senior citizen. <laughs> <laughs> years old, a former Mr. England, a former Mr. Universe, 1984 World Pro Champion, a big hand for the one and only Albert Beckel. I gotta turn the music back down. He's dancing his way up there. So what did, what was Beckel's missing to beat Lee Haney? Uh, I think he just wasn't big enough. He was very hard, very in great condition. You can see like here when he does his rear double bicep, he's just shredded. You know, he's got that real hard muscularity. A lot of back. Very thin, very thin skin, yeah. But a uh, little light on the calves. He had uh, kind of high calves. Oh, and just when he stood next to uh, Haney, he just wasn't big enough. You know, Haney was just so much bigger than everybody. Yeah. Back when they used to judge calves, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think he was fourth this year at the um, 84 Olympia. Okay. So people loved him because he, he kind of created, I mean, Beckles was around for a long time. He started competing in the 60s. Yeah. But uh, when he got older, he, he kind of had like a resurgence in his career and he came in really ripped. And huh. uh, he, he started winning contests again because he had a lull like in the late 70s he where he wasn't doing that well. Yeah. And then. In the 80s, he came back in the early <laughs> 80s, and he started coming in really ripped, and he was winning contests again. And then he was older. He was, like, in his late 40s, early 50s, and he would come out, and he would dance like a disco routine. And people loved it. You know, they go, oh, look at this older guy who's shredded. And he's dancing, you know? <laughs> and you know what, too? I think that speaks to a guy that didn't need to use a lot of enhancements to get where he got. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. the guys that have to push it really hard to get to that level, they're the guys, they're not going to be there 15 years later. They're not going to make a comeback a decade right. down the road. You know, they're going to do right. what they're going to do. Yeah. And he had a long career. He started off, I mean, Arnold's first Mr. Universe win in 1967, uh, Albert won the medium class and Arnold won the tall class. So that's how far he goes back. He goes back to like the mid early 60s when he was competing in Barbados and then he moved to England. He was living in England. And uh, and then he continued all the way into the late 80s, early 90s. So that was a 30-year career. Yeah, those biceps are freaking nuts, too. I bet he still has those arms today. I'll you know what I does. mean? <laughs> a little smaller, maybe. But look at that. Yeah. Jeez. The peaks. <laughs> Let's see what he has to say here. And even better than I expect or hope to. Uh, I was second, very close second. So according to these kind of uh, improvements that I'm fortunately back to me, I don't see why or how I can lose. Lee Haney is a great champion and he's good. Um, but I still think I can beat him. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a time when they were hesitant, I think, to have African-Americans um, as like the guy on the magazine from what I remember, like, yeah, like early, early too. on. Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting that something definitely shifted when you have Lee Haney and Albert Beckles are so undeniable. You know what I'm saying? That it's like, well, what are you going to yeah. do now? Now <laughs> you don't have a choice. Right. But that was just the contest though. But you're right, Scott. I mean, I remember like Weeder was criticized a lot for not putting Lee Haney on the cover more. Because oh, really? It was like meeting Mr. Olympia every year. And yet yeah. he would put like, Gunther Sleer camp or not? Who Gunther wasn't around back then? But he put like Matt Mendenhall, he put Bob Paris, he put yeah. Rich Gaspari on the cover. The white guy, the good white guy. Lee Haney on the cover, you know. That's interesting. Even though he was Mister Olympia. Yeah, man, I would love to go to Santa Santa Monica in, in Venice in, in this. The like, if we could have a time machine. Yeah, I would love right. that too. Southern California 
has become the mecca of bodybuilding. Yeah, there's world's uh, gyms, Aside though. from the, the beautiful weather and, uh, and the good food and everything right else, the is the fact too. that the two like most famous gyms in the world are located here. Now, they're very different gyms. One of them is Joe Gold's World Gym. Now, Joe Gold also started Gold's Gym. That was back in 1965, but he sold it in 1970, and some other people have developed it into uh, one of the greatest gyms in the world. But Joe Gold got back in the gym business, and he started Joe Gold's World Gym. So now you've got Joe Gold's World Gym, and you've got Gold's Gym down the street, two very different gyms. You got it? Kick we got it. That's, it. That's good. Good. Yeah, it's very good. Just the way you should. Damn, you get some, you'll get some good legs out on it. <laughs> Keep the butt down. That's it, B. Keep going. Okay, again. Stay on there about a good half hour. Keep yourself trim. <laughs> so that's Joe Gold, right? Yeah, that's Joe Gold, yeah. Bodybuilding started right here in Santa Monica. Probably Vic Tandy had the first gym, and his gym started in 1939. It was located in 2nd Street. And from there, he evolved into multiple, multiple gyms all through California and all through the United States. But the real popularity of bodybuilding stayed right here in Santa Monica, right on the beach. We had our own weightlifting pit down there. It was great in the old days. And it moved from there indoors because they didn't want us on the beach anymore. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's why he created Gold's Gym was because they kicked him out of uh, out of the beach. Really? And then he started his own gym in 1965. So he, he started Gold's Gym the first year the Olympia started in 65. Okay. So, but they had the, they still have the weight pit down there. Was it taken out for a time or? Yeah, they had a bigger one. I believe it was on, it might've been Santa Monica Pier. Okay. And uh, I think they would train underneath this pier. like. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then there was accusations from the, the city that uh, there was illicit sex acts going on under there or something. So they ended up closing <laughs> the whole thing down. Okay. <laughs> Weird, and I never heard about that before. The under the pier, Jim. Yeah. Huh, that's wild. And hey, knowing bodybuilding, I wouldn't be surprised if there was illicit stuff going on <laughs> under the pier. Their bodies. They're not interested in disco music. They're not interested in playing around. The people that are not interested. I get rid of them immediately. I only keep the serious people here in the gym. <laughs> he kicked out a lot of people, didn't he? Yeah. Those old school gym owners always did that. Like uh, Steve Mihalik did it in New York, and did he? Uh, George, George Turner did it in St. Louis. Yeah, you know they didn't they didn't put up with any shit. It was their gym. If they didn't like you, they just kick you out. You know. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Joe jacket. ended up losing his uh, his leg later on. He had it amputated. I think it was from diabetes. Oh, so he geez. was in a wheelchair later on in his life. No kidding. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, World Gym has attempted to remain in old-fashioned, hardcore gym as much as possible. Now, there's the three Gold owners under the Gold, guidance that's of owners Pete Kowski Kowski on the left, and, and Tim Connors Kimber and, Tim Kimber and Ed Connors. Follow a different philosophy. Ed Connors, yeah. Hardcore training Sprague. and commercial and success. They moved it to uh, where its current location is, and then, and then they started, and they started franchising it, so they we made millions and millions of dollars. You know? Okay. We've got uh, over 200 gyms worldwide. Uh, they're all licensed Gold's gyms. And uh, even though we went commercial to some extent to expand gold's gym we realized that gold's gym couldn't uh everyone couldn't come to gold's gym so we decided to bring gold's gym to everyone we could hmm. i remember that look the the leotard with the the, yeah. the thong and all that i remember that yeah. look because back in this age and this era my dad and mom trained and they trained hard okay. and I, I used to go to the gym with them but i was too young to lift and they had like a kids area but then they also okay. uh they had like one room off to the side where the kids could be but i'd come out to the floor and just basically sit away from everything in the corner sit up against the wall while everybody else was lifting and uh yeah my That's dad had cool. a bunch of big friends back then guys that were into yeah. powerlifting, guys that were into bodybuilding they all had that haircut the with the mullet in the back wearing the track suit you know <laughs> be the right. mickey mouse kind of bodybuilding turned into a, a tremendous asset for us you know so we're really pleased and proud of this guy iconic logo a little hair <laughs> 
Well, Pete Gronkowski back in the day was huge. I don't know if you ever saw pictures of him, but he competed in the Mr. America back in the early 70s. Okay. He was massive. And, and he was also known for taking a lot of steroids. Oh, he really? He was one of those guys to experiment and really push it as huh. far as the steroids go. And he would he would openly talk about it, too. No kidding. In this is Bob both Harris. the men's and the women's aspect of the sport, it's becoming less and less uh, desirable for the, the average Joe on the street to, to want to have anything to do with the sport. Huh. It seems as if aesthetics and beauty of physique are not really taken into consideration. It's, it amazes me because the sport that wants so badly to grow and expand seems to hold itself back. So from my own standpoint, I'm trying to project to not only the bodybuilding public, but to the general public, um, the outlook that you can be sort of normal. You can be fashion conscious. When did he you come out as being gay? About your look two years well later. As, and as two years after this. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful physique and uh, maximizing your own potential. Oh, they cut the music out here for us. We don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah so this, that, was his, this was his first Olympia in 84 here. Okay. And him coming out as gay, that did cause him some some issues, didn't it, with uh, the oh, organization yeah. and stuff? Big, big thing back then, yeah. Yeah. Because he was he was very uh, good looking guy. Women love this guy. I mean, just okay. loved him. <laughs> and he was very classy. Like you could see the way he was dressed. He wouldn't dress like an average bodybuilder. He would dress very nice, like dressed like a GQ model. You know, and the okay. way he spoke. And um, I mean, I didn't know that he was gay, so I was shocked. I mean, but I guess if you were in the California area, it was kind of known that he was. Okay. But Joe, Joe Weider would never say it. Interesting, you know? huh? I know he lives on Vancouver Island with his partner now. Oh, does he? Okay. Yep. Yeah, I've seen pictures of him on, on social media, but he's really skinny now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he stopped lifting for sure. Uh, very much against anabolics. I'm not saying that I've never used them, um, but I'm very much against them. But to have the feeling that I must use them in order to compete, to, to be forced to do that is extremely frustrating and disillusioning. Yeah. In the gym, even, I, uh, I'm very aware of the negative connotations of the of the grunting, greased up, flexing, massive vein bodybuilder, and I don't want to be seen in that light whatsoever. I don't want to be identified with that at all, huh. and so therefore I usually train covered up. I wear I wear a sweatshirt in the gym or, and shorts, and uh, train as I'm comfortable. But it's not important for my ego to be oogled and admired. Uh, constantly every day and to have my physique perused each time <laughs> I come into the gym. I'm there to do something for myself and to use the time as economically as possible and uh, I dress for the utility of that purpose. When's the last time you used perused in a sentence, uh, Scott? Used what? <laughs> used the word perused. <laughs> yeah, not often. Not often. <laughs> Now, see, if this wasn't the 80s and he had the purple shorts on, I would have yeah. called it. But because it's the 80s, everybody had purple shorts. You never would have guessed, you know. But for sure, based off everything you said, I I would be certain that he was a world's gym guy. He didn't probably want to have anything to do with all the nonsense at Gold's. Absolutely. You're right. Mr. Universe being the American national champion. Joe Gold really liked him, too. Oh, I can see why, man. He took what he's doing seriously. He's a you know respectable yeah. human being. He's not causing trouble. He's probably, Joe would like all of his uh, clientele to be like him. Right. Right, right. It's crazy to see those little tiny platforms on the lake. Yeah, it is, it is crazy. I bet it really hit your quads. Yeah. And just last week, I figured that I'd turned down and missed out on over a million dollars worth of work um, in the film industry and in the fashion industry by training for the Mr. Olympia because it would have been work that was far too intense to accompany intense training for a show. So, um, I don't know, that's my dilemma right now. Should I continue to pursue being competitive? Should I put it on the back burner for a while? After all, I'm 25 years old. We have competitors who are 50 years old. Um, yeah. Or should I consider myself having gone through that phase of being a competitive bodybuilder? And now Bob Paris moves on 
to pursue other projects. How much longer did Bob he Harris, compete? Quite frankly, has a lot of interests in life um, besides he stopped. just competitive bodybuilding. I think in '86. Oh yeah, hold that, hold that thought, hold that thought, and then you can just start back up after I after okay. this picks back up. He wanted to pursue an acting career, like being a real actor, like in theater, not just in movies. Oh yeah. So he stepped away for only like a year or two, I think, and then I think he came back in late '87, and then in '88 he looked fantastic. He got third place at the Night of the Champions, the year Phil Hill won. Okay. And he looked awesome. Um, but Paris was always like touted as like the next Mr. Olympia because he had a Steve Reeves like physique. He was tall. He was like six feet tall, I believe. And, uh, he looked more like Steve Reeves than Frank Zane did, you know, he yeah. was, you know, he had really good legs and they just kept after him. You know, you got to get bigger. You got to get more ripped. You got to get bigger. And he wouldn't do it. He's like, no, I have an idea of my mind, what I want to look like. And that's it. And I'm not going to go past that. And I, I think you could see that with the, he was talking about steroids there. Like, I don't want to push it too much, you know? And um, so he never got freaky and he wasn't able to challenge Haney. And he would go into shows a lot of times, like a little smaller or too smooth. And he, he had the genetics, but he just didn't really push it. He wasn't as hungry as like, yeah. Spari, you know, but yeah. I think it was because he had this idea in his mind of what he should look like, you know? Yeah, he he had an aesthetic in his brain an and he stuck to yeah, it. Yeah, which I, I kind of give him credit for because he stuck to it and he didn't go to the whim of the judges. You know, he just kind of did what he wanted to do. So I give him credit. He had the courage to do that, um, but it did kind of hurt his career. And then once he came out in 88 and he said he was gay, I think, I mean, he still competed after that for a couple more years, but th they weren't looking at him then as a Mr. Olympia hopeful after that, you know. Yeah. Now, who are we looking at here? Oh, thank you. I believe this girl's name is Carla Green. Carla she was from Green. Canada, from Vancouver. Hey, Tori, yeah. do you know Carla Green from uh, Victoria, Canada, or Vancouver? No? Just wondering. Victoria knows all the females. <laughs> yeah. She just brought me a cherry Pepsi Zero. These are so good. Oh, man. I don't think she did very well in competitions, but she was competing. Okay. I always I always enjoy watching this uh, footage of her stretching on the beach every time I watch <laughs> this video. <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to imagine she was considered to be like very muscular at that time. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, she's yeah. not even muscular for a bikini girl now. No, she really isn't. You know, I mean, she's she's definitely fit. She's got muscle, but I know a lot of women that have that much muscle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like like in they're not even competing. Right. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 40 years ago, it was totally different. Oof, man, I'd tear my shoulder trying to do that. <laughs> that does not look safe. <laughs> Particularly for the reasons that I, I want to be part of what's involved and I want to know what's going on. And being up in Vancouver, I was I didn't have yeah, access Vancouver. to things that were available. Um, John knows everybody in this sport, guys. <laughs> here is superior to what I've been exposed to up there. There are more professional bodybuilders down here, um, and their knowledge is accessible to me as well. I'm not so sure if her name was Carla Green or Carla Temple. I don't know. It might be Carla Temple. I'm wondering if this is before people were doing fake boobs, because I'm just wondering. I think it might have been, yeah. In the 80s, I don't think it was that popular. She had some good genetics, then. We'll say that. She had good genetics, yes. Push. Very, very beautiful girl. Good stuff. Come on. Push. Okay, Carla Green. If so, it looks like she might have dated Lou Ferrigno. Is that it? Oh, that's Carla's. That's his wife. I'm sorry. So it's not Carla Green. It's Carla Temple. Okay, Carla Temple. Oops, I better turn this down in case this is some sort of monetized music. There's a bunch of it in here. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm looking her up. Carla this guy's name was Rick something, I believe. I can't remember his last name. Oh, yeah. Okay, so she did get into really good shape. Uh, once she got... So she's definitely off-season here. But once she got into shape, you could definitely see a lot more definition in her shoulders, her arms, good quads okay. on her. She's had some muscle on her for sure. Did she ever win a show or just placed high? Uh, let's see. I'm not sure. Um, 
No, she said, it, I'm not sure. Well, she was at the Olympia. Okay. Um, she placed fifth and still holds the highest title of any Canadian female bodybuilder in the Olympia. This was from Muscle Insider. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been broken since. What year did she take fifth? Uh, let's see. Enthusiast in 82. She competed after just 10 weeks of training and won her first bodybuilding competition. She went on to win the BC Provincial Championships in Western Canada uh, concurrently. That was 83. Uh, a few months later, let's see, in 84, she competed in the World's Pro Invitational, fifth place. It was invited to the coveted Miss Olympia, where she placed fifth. So it would have been okay. 84. After that, uh, years of seminar tours, public appearances, TV shows, movies, and print advertising. She went on to become a personal trainer, and she shared her secrets with many clients. Carla Temple. Yeah. That other girl they were just showing, that big girl, that was Tegan Cleave, I believe. Okay. Tegan was, her? Uh, yeah. Kind of crazy, you know, wild hair. and Yeah. Uh, she was big, you know, and she trained really heavy and hard. And there was a famous incident where she was at a contest uh -huh. and she, she went into the women's bathroom. And when she came out, this cop, like the skinny security guard cop was there and he grabbed her and he put her in a headlock because he thought she was a guy going into the woman's bathroom. Oh, dude. Yeah. And then there's a picture in Flex where Rick Valente is trying to talk to the cop, like, let her go. That's a girl. That's a girl. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. I don't know what the hell really, she's doing there, but yeah, she's she was like kind of crazy, kind of unorthodox. And I'm not but sure people, who this. Let's see if we can turn this up and find out. No, we can't turn it up. But this people were still like girl of gold. They were figuring things out back then. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. they didn't have. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's because of them. And the people who did things that were weird and unorthodox that we discovered a lot of new stuff and we discovered yeah. what not to do too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Wild, huh? Oh yeah, she's geared up. <laughs> Look at this. Yeah, like that. <laughs> what the oh, heck is I'm that? Game is watching it. Yeah. <laughs> How do you use this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you go backwards? <laughs> oh my god, I wish we could play this sound here because she's definitely got a great monologue happening yeah. throughout this. <laughs> but at this point, women were getting really involved with the sport too. It wasn't yes. just a guy's yeah. thing anymore. Yeah, this is 86, so yeah, I mean, women's, the Miss Olympia started in 1980, so it was getting really popular. Um, and then it was just kind of, this was start. This is where the debate was starting, like how big do the women get, you know, like, okay. uh, Corey won it, I think, in 84, yeah. and she was tall and athletic looking and, and pretty muscular, more so than like uh, Rachel McLish was. Yeah. But then uh, toward the end of the 80s, like 89, when Corey won her last one, that's when they were starting to get really muscular. Yeah. Oh, and then the 90s, just things went crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Then when um, Linda came in, they got really got much, much bigger. In the sport of bodybuilding, you really have to be available to the people who are going to promote you through the sport. And that would be the magazine publishers or editors, writers, uh, anybody in the television or screen business. It's all happening down here. And you can really hear of a lot of things through... The, the network and that could be through the your fellow competitors the gyms or whoever you're going to have access to that and it's available to you but you have to be available to them unlike yeah, now California, where you do everything California online happening. <sighs> now this is uh frank richards so frank was another bodybuilder from the 60s he was around during Arnold's time and he was a very big guy from england and he had a lot of potential and then he was uh he was working construction and he fell off a beam oh geez. And he fell like i think 10 feet or 12 feet and he really messed himself up he broke his wrist and you know he Broke all these different bones and stuff. Really is, is the and he had to take off a long time. He almost killed himself. 
Jeez, no came, kidding. He came back in the 80s. So uh, he came back in 85, I believe, at the Night of the Champions. And then he was in the 85 Olympia as well. Okay. So he did pretty good. He, when he came back, he wasn't as big. He had more of a muscular, uh, more ripped physique. Yeah. Where back in the day, he was kind of like an Arnold type where he was really big and, and uh, massive. Okay. Uh, so his physique kind of changed as he got older. But uh, I think he competed for about mm, maybe five years in the 80s. And then he retired. All right, let's see what he has to say here. Full 24 hours a day of your life. Uh, I've, I've played um, the English game of rugby. I was also a sprinter at national level, and I liked the weights more than the other sports. <laughs> Arnold said, I always said, make the weights rattle when there's cameras around. It sounds heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it really is to me it's the king of sports bodybuilding it also is a sport that gives you a long long last man as a competitor I made a uh, comeback after 15 years Al Bettles has made a comeback Bill Pearls made a comeback there's various bodybuilders who've made comebacks simply because you are able to do it you you can train in in bodybuilding as long as you are mentally capable mentally capable. Physically capable but simply because as long as you are mentally capable the physical side will always take care of itself this is really true it's isn't the it the mental attitude that changes yeah and as long you as notice you they weren't going drive, super heavy back then, then too scott they were just trying to feel oh, the muscle look like yeah until you're 60. <sighs> Yeah, everybody did those lateral raises freaking through the sky. You know what I mean? Like way, <laughs> way overhead. Right. And they would bring them in front of their thighs, too. Oh, I, I've seen um, uh, Franco do lateral raises that were like way up here. You know what yeah, I mean? It's like, right. what are you doing, Franco? But they made it work. You know, look at that. Back in the day yeah. when you had those those camel cigarette ads right. on a big billboard. <laughs> That's funny. But it's got to be done. You know, you see, you've got to put blinkers on, really. Ten weeks prior to a college, just put blinkers on. Don't see anything around you. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm telling you, John, instead of doing reaction videos, we need, like, a time machine where we can just go back in time <laughs> and we can, like, talk to all these people and stuff. Just hang out. Yeah. There's the weight pit on gold. So they still had the yeah, weight pit the there. Yeah. That's changed a lot since then. Oh yeah, yeah. Look how look how Venice Beach looks so different too. It really does. When's the last time you were out at Golds in Venice? Just a couple years ago. Um, okay. I think two years ago. Yeah. Okay, so this has been after the changes, post uh, you know shutdowns and all of that. Uh, yeah. I heard it's a lot different now than it used to be. Yeah, it was still pretty crowded, um, um, but you know, yeah, all the COVID stuff was over with. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they. I heard they got all sorts of new equipment people. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of new equipment and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You have a man first What is that? Or I think he has a camera. He has a, a camera, camera with okay. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a big old lens on it, which we can probably take pictures just as good now on our cell phones. You know. Yeah, he might have just been visiting California. Maybe it was after that contest that Gaspari won that Pro World because he was in that too. So okay. maybe he went out there for some photo shoots and maybe he was just – because I think he lived in England. I don't think he moved to California. Yeah. Oh, man, I wish we could see those prices. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Remember when, like, you get a, a soda, 25 cents, 50 cents, right. something like that? Hey, while we're there in our time machine, why don't we buy some properties right there yeah, on the beach? I was just thinking that too. <laughs> a couple of condos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Competing in, um, people started to book me for guest appearances. So even though I never appeared on stage for 15 years, um, I was booked for the four months by the night. Yeah. It was hard. And Especially for a more mature bodybuilder, too. He looks great. Right. right. He was a good poser, too. I got in the first five. I think well, where he placed in the Olympia in 85. I don't think he, I don't think I he made top 10. What was his name again? Frank Richard. Okay. I'll look him up. Frank Richard. But he won his class in the NABA back in, like, 1970. Okay. 15 years later. 
Let's see here. Frank Richards. Yeah, this is post contest because he's in, eating some cake now. Yeah, I'd love to go back then and see. I'm seeing yeah, pictures like of him. Too. I mean, he really did have a great physique. Yeah, it's too bad he got in that accident because they were saying he was going to be the next Arnold, you know? He came in 10th at the 85. Oh, okay, so he didn't yeah, make yeah. top 10. Yeah. Hey, but it goes to show, man, you never know when bodybuilding is going to, you know, competitive bodybuilding is going to get taken away from you. So it's yeah. like, you know, you can complain uh, during your prep and stuff. But honestly, I, I just, I'm grateful. You know, you know what I mean, John? Like you're still dieting yeah. down and getting into great shape. It's like, I yeah. have gratitude every time I've gotten into really good shape now, because you never know yeah. if this is going to be the last time you're going to be able to do it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I know a lot of guys, older guys that can't train at all now, you know, cause they got nerve damage or, or things yeah. like that. And you're still blasting, man. You're still hitting the weights hard. Uh, yeah. Thank God. <laughs> This is uh, Kay Baxter. She was one of the early bodybuilders. She had a pretty muscular physique. Right now I have a pull in one of my biceps. And it's all the much time. better now since they've been working on it. Looks like they're doing some it's ART almost. Yeah, looks like this was one of the first uh, sports it's therapy. slowly getting better. I've hurt my back before. I could hardly stand up. And I, I remember coming in here, and I said, please, uh, Gary, give me some help right away. That guy's shirt couldn't did. be it's more great. unbuttoned. He has, it like, two buttons that. down, down at the bottom. I couldn't stand up straight. <laughs> Actually, I'm more injury-free now than I've been in a long time. It's crazy, Scott, because, you know, I remember training back in the 80s, and if I had injuries, there was really, unless you found a good chiropractor, there was no nowhere to go. You know, yeah. they didn't have yeah. all these uh, clinics. This is Charles Glass here. Oh, two yeah. Two days ago and came in. And in that time, he's experiencing pain in the upper back. What we're doing now is going in and breaking up the adhesions with movement through that muscle in the proper direction with the proper pressure. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to find yeah. a, a practitioner like okay. this back then easily. Not okay. not too easily, right? Very yeah. rare. Oh Dude, okay. even in like the mid, so like early 2000s, it was hard to action. find somebody for me. Yeah. When I first started getting therapy, this back, back in, I couldn't even squat 135 without pain. And since I've been coming here getting therapy, well, no wonder your I'm freaking right shoulder now, hurts, to, dude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, it really loosened the back up and it strengthened the back in a sense because it allowed me to do more of the back movements that I couldn't do to help. So, I mean, I would. I really want to surprise him on our wedding day. Yes, yeah, I'll just cut all these out. Nobody will know. Yeah. That I'm getting. I wouldn't miss this movie. <laughs> oh, we gotta turn that down. We got some good old uh, classic hip hop <laughs> happening here. Oh, no wonder we do, because we got Mike, uh, Christian. Mike Christian showing up here. Have you had Mike on your show? Yes. How he was, was he great. to interview? He was good. He, very interesting life. He was in the gangs and stuff when he was younger. Oh, yeah. What did he say about that? Not a lot, you know, but he just said he had a pretty tough uh, beginning. You know, he came from Oregon and then he moved to uh, L.A. Okay. But I think he was, was he in the gangs in L.A.? I think he was. I can't remember. It was a few years ago that I uh, interviewed him. Okay. That's a look right there. The stringer and the do-rag. Yeah. Man, he looked so good, too. If I'm not mistaken, I think that uh, that stringer is going to pop. Like it's going to break. <laughs> it's pretty dang close. It's holding on by a thread right now. Yeah. So Mike won the Nationals in 84, and uh, Gaspari was in that show too. Gaspari won the light heavyweights, but Mike was the guy, you know, and yeah. everybody thought he was going to be the guy to challenge Haney. So when they turned pro, Gaspari all of a sudden popped ahead of uh, Mike because Gaspari was like 20 pounds heavier when he turned pro. Okay. So uh, Mike and Gaspari had a big rivalry, and this, like at that uh, Pro World in '86, um, it was Mike and Gaspari one and two, and Gaspari beat them both times because there was a show in LA too, and he beat them there, and then he always beat them in the Olympia too. So uh, it was kind of surprising to Mike because he thought he was going to be have a great pro career, and it was going to be between him and Haney, you know, for the contest. And yeah. He's training there with, with Luis Fritas Fritas from Brazil. Oh, and yeah, yeah. 
do. Yeah. I remember yes, seeing I him on the uh, pump for gold, pumping for golds movie. Right. Right. Yeah. He had great legs. Yeah. Really good physique. Smaller guy overall. Smaller structure too. But he, he, he well, but he was decently heavy. I wanted to say, right? Yeah, he was a heavyweight. Here, I think he breaks it here. Oh, you yeah. were right. You weren't joking. He literally broke it. That's okay. And he he just mad. retired. I yeah. I was watching this. He goes, damn it. <laughs> do extra four or five reps, and he wouldn't do it, you know? And I'm that type, I'm that type of person. You know, I need that extra four or five reps. I need somebody to yell at me. I need somebody to push me. Yeah, he had a killer physique. He really yeah, did. Great shoulders, arms. His arms yeah. and shoulders for a reason. Right back. He was made for a stringer. You know what I mean? Those chest, shoulders, yeah. arms. Absolutely. Tell me, tell me. Great personality, too. Oh, yeah. To find a good training partner. I like how he's very, pulling. Very hot. And thank God I got one this time. Luis Frides, he's from Brazil. He's a becoming bodybuilder. He placed uh, eighth or ninth in the universe this year. And he's a big kid. Very symmetrical. Very good looking. Uh, trains like animals just like me. 87. Uh, really, Maybe 87. Uh, we have his special magic together. You know, I mean, uh, he he's wants pulling to higher. that is me. And yeah. we just really clicked together. I'm very happy with him. Stretch. Stretch. Five more. One. He had a real high voice, too. For a big he did. Guy. He did. Three. Back to back, right here. Four. It looks like he dyes his hair here. Yeah. A good training partner, I tell you what it is. Big dudes. You have to have somebody yeah. that Both of them. you can listen to. You know, like when they say five more yeah, reps, you can do it. Just biceps. anybody can't tell me five more reps. You know, it takes a certain type of voice, a certain type of person for me to listen to. That's why I can't just train with anybody. Okay. Five more and one. And two. You know, I have to see something, and I have to see that he will do five more if I tell him, you know, and he is able to do it, you know. So that's one thing, the magic I feel between me and him. He wants it just as bad as me. We're both young, hungry lions. <laughs> yes. I like the smack talk between him and Lee Haney. Yeah, yeah. Five more, let's go. Yeah. Man, he made some some noise too. He wasn't. He, he was like a. It popped again, man. <laughs> Lost his stringer again. Yeah, he would never fit in at World's Gym. No, God, no. Yeah, he's a Gold's guy by all means. Yeah. Yeah, he got mad. So I guess part of being Mike's training partner is you have to keep tying his. Uh, stringer <laughs> you have to tie his clothes back together when they rip apart when he when he gets a pump. It's part of the job. And he always wore those do rags too. Yeah, yeah, he always did, didn't he? Yeah. Did he have what? What was his clothing line? Was he, did he do crazy wear? I think Stridum had crazy wear. Crazy I think he wear? had platinum, platinum, platinum wear, platinum okay. everywhere. Or something. Yeah. It's different. It's a little more relaxed, you know, and it's a little smaller. I need a big gym with big guys around me. <laughs> He's oh, talking, talking about going to Gold's. <laughs> yeah. That's a big gym, too, man. Look at all that equipment in there. Yeah. And I think it was all one room back then. So they said the oh. atmosphere was crazy. So everybody was just jammed in this one room with the music blasting, you know? Yeah. The bay doors are open. Cal hot California day. Man, that, yeah. would be, that would be awesome to go see that back then. <laughs> <laughs> little loose uh, training style there. Yeah, yeah. That girl's jacked for the time. Yeah. Everybody's getting after it, though. You see that? Yeah, well, everybody trained hard, yeah. Because it all rubbed off on everybody, you know? Yeah. They said when they would put good music on, the place, the intensity would just go up. Oh, know? I bet, <laughs> man. I bet. Yeah, I think people go to the gym for a lot of different reasons today. And yeah. I think some people, man, they don't even they like they they look down on training hard. Like they're like, oh, I'm yeah. not one of those people. I just, you know, you just you keep your cool kind of attitude. It's like, no, man, right. get in there and you give it. You know, you right, give right. everything you can. Well, they're too busy on their phones. You got to check their phones. <laughs> yeah, this would have been an awesome freaking era. Yeah. 
So they have I think Lee I in this? the first time in 1990. So it was right around this time. But I remember okay. everybody was there, you know, all the yeah. big dudes in there. And it was just such a great atmosphere. I bet. How how big were you in 90? Well, I was competing. I was big. Yeah. Yeah. So were you, were you out there just to visit? Or are you doing a show yeah, out there or something? Visit. Yeah. A friend okay. of mine was out there uh, all right. visiting his sister. So me and him went out there. Nice. But we went to Gold's every day. I bet you did, man. Who do you remember seeing in 1990 that, that like you that re, you really remember? Uh, I remember uh, Roland Kickinger was doing uh, inclines with like hundred pound dumbbells, but he was massive. He was huge. I don't know him. Oh yeah, he was the guy that would like kind of looked like Arnold. They said he was like the next Arnold. And, okay, uh, he, he was a pro for a while, but he never did anything. Oh, and then he got into movies and stuff. Okay. I want to win, you know. I want to show the other competitors and the judges and the people in the audience that I am the best. I saw Barry DeMay there. There's Barry DeMay on the right. Oh, it's yeah. Lee cannot get much bigger than he is now. Lee, Gaspari, Beckles, all of the top five, all of the top ten. I am the only competitor that can really put more muscle on his frame because my frame is taller and bigger than other competitors and the tallest competitor. So what I have to do is I have to keep on putting more muscle on, which I do every year. I put six yeah, to eight pounds of muscle on, you know, which is phenomenal. Yeah, body still body overall body. crazy physique. It's just a matter of yeah. time for me, and I think it's always time. rip. I was always ready. He was never out of condition. Is it possible that you're underestimating some of the other people? I mean, after all, Rich Gaspari is very good. Albert Beckles, Beckles is very good. Yeah. Uh, don't you have to keep them in mind as well, well of as... Of course. Uh, I, Lee? You know, I don't... Lee Haney's the man to beat. No question about that. But of course, I see Albert Beckles and Rich Gaspari haven't beat them yet either, you know? So, uh, no, no. I'm just... All competitors are equal. You know, I just... I go for number one, you know? <laughs> true if you finish first you beat everybody that's right exactly well listen good luck in the olympia thank you Phil. okay we'll take it he was kind of one of those guys that <laughs> mr that o 85 question mark he was one of those guys you're on there i can't i can't remember. yeah i think it said 85 yeah time to hit the road to the mr olympia so we don't get to actually see the Olympia now. This is all just leading up to it. Yeah, huh? I think they filmed this probably in the spring. You know, it looked like it was right after that pro world. Okay. The Olympia. But I think this was the first video they did like this because that other one you guys saw was the was before '88. Yeah. Oh that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's the there we are on stage now. Lee Haney yeah. does it again. I think this was '84. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Featuring in order of appearance, Tom Plants, Rich Gaspari. I mean, all these people, man, were freaking, you know, all of them were amazing guys back then. Yep, Carla Temple. Yeah. And Tegan Clive. I've known that name. She was something else. Lori Green. She must have been the other girl working out. Yeah. Oh, Rich Martinelli. That was the guy that was working out with uh, Carla. Okay. I knew they were rich. Yeah, this is freaking awesome, man. This is This is cool. <laughs> Plus, like I said, there's nobody better to watch this with than you, because John Hansen, you, you're you literally like the best bodybuilding historian that I know. You knew just about every single one of these people and knew some sort of factoid about at least each one. How many times do you think you've seen this movie? I've probably seen it at least 30 times, yeah. <laughs> I bet. I mean, well, I, I knew exactly when Mike's thing was going to rip. No, right? That's what I was thinking, man. So <laughs> the thing is, is that for some people, this might be their first time watching this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So we encourage you guys going back uh, in, in watching the whole thing again, you know, without us talking over it. Um, <laughs> we'll have to find something else. Maybe you guys can comment. What do you guys want to hear us uh, react to and, and review and watch with you next? People loved the last one. So hopefully they get as much out of this one, John. Yeah, that was great doing with you, Scott. I, I love doing these. these Me too, fun. man. This is a blast. Hey, if people want to reach out to you uh, for coaching, anything like that, what's the best way to reach out? John Hansen Fitness is my website. So Okay. John has there, yeah. John Hansen Fitness dot com. And of course, oh, wow. go to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. A lot of these guys that you saw in this video, you could literally hear John get to interview them. So you've got a yeah. you've got a huge archive, man, of a lot of the yeah, greats. That's it. Um, my website for that is bodybuilding show dot com. So okay. you, that's the official website for the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And if you go to that uh, website and click on uh, podcast. You'll see all the podcasts I've done over the last six and a half years. 
Okay, they're listed on the website even, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you see the ones with like Albert Beckles and Lee Haney and uh, Rich Gaspari. I, I got to interview Chris Dickerson before he passed away. I had some great interviews with Boyer Co. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of older guys too. Some of them who have unfortunately passed away since then. So I even interviewed Winston Roberts, who was a judge at the eighty one Olympia, and I got to ask oh, him how yeah. he judged the eighty one Olympia. Yeah, and, and Winston passed away only a couple months after I interviewed him. So that was, okay. I was glad I got to talk to him. That is cool. And, and at the end of the day, man, like this is, this is how we record the history is the stuff yeah. we're doing, you know, us talking exactly. about this, you doing your interviews. Like this is, this is important stuff in my opinion. Uh, I, I think so too. Yeah. You know, we, we can't really understand where we are unless we understand where we came from, you know? Right. And uh, right. history of bodybuilding is rich and it's freaking awesome. So it's, I, this has been a blast, man. Of course, yeah. uh, check out uh, all of our stuff. Uh, you could, by the way, though, John, you're also on iTunes and all of that. So if they don't want to, yes. if they want to go straight to the podcast app, they can, they can find bodybuilding legends. Yeah, I'm on show Spotify there. and Apple iTunes. So yeah, you can get the podcast each week on there. Um, we've got the end of the year coming up now. So we've got our shows with Jerry Branham that I do every year. We go back. We don't talk about the year that just passed. We go back 50 years since we're a history show. We go back 50 years, 40 years, 30 years and talk about like 93, 83 and 73 and what happened. Wow. Those years. So it's pretty oh, that's cool, man. That's freaking yeah. awesome. So check out that. And uh, of course, check out our great sponsors, trinutrition.com. Use our code THINK. Uh, people have been asking about merch. So we've got merch now. Uh, cool. I'll have the link for that below. And uh, shirts are like 30 bucks, basically. We've got we've got like the athletic fit. We've got loose fit. There's a bunch of different color options. So when you click on each shirt, you can see the drop down menu. So I picked the red one, but we have this in a bunch of different colors and the white logo. We've got the It's Just Bodybuilding shirt. Christmas cabbage shirt for the Drugs and Stuff podcast and all of that. And of course, thank you to everybody who's helping to support the programming on Patreon. You guys are freaking awesome. And uh, you've got a YouTube too, John, right? It's a, is it Bodybuilding yeah, John Legend? Hansen. Under John Hansen. Oh, it's under John Hansen. And some of your shows you've done, you actually have like whole videos that you've put together of old footage yeah. and pictures to go with what you're talking about. I try about, to right? do that with all of them. Yeah. Especially, you know, if I've done the video interviews, I try to put it up on YouTube too, but I edit them and you understand this cause you do a lot of editing. I put all the pictures in there of the contests they're talking about. So it takes a while. So I'm a little behind on that, but I'm getting them up like every week, you know? Cool. Well, I'm sure that everybody can go back then and look at the archive, you know, cause yeah. you've put a bunch of them out that way. And yeah, man, I know how much work that takes. It's all a, that's a lot. <laughs> So anyways, we appreciate you guys tuning in. And like I said, comment below. Let us know what you want to hear us, uh, you know, review next. It'll be a blast. Yeah, I'm out. All right, John, we'll let you get it going. I know you got your workout to do next. All right. All right. Thanks, Scott. Great seeing you again, buddy. You too, Happy man. Happy New Year. You too.